Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Josh Hodges. I'm the host of Online with an Architect. Uh, very happy to have Mel Shaw from VMware with us today. Welcome, Mel. Thanks, Josh. Great Good to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. So we're going to talk all things VMware education, enablement, and certification. Um, so can you give us a quick intro on, on who you are and, and what you do at VMware? Yeah. So I run VMware Learning for Australia and New Zealand, and I also play a role in leading our digital learning uh, across APJ. So I run a small team in the ANZ region, which is uh, learning solutions executives, partner business managers, learning solutions architects, and uh, we have uh, one uh, staff technical trainer in the ANZ region, and we deliver all of the training and certification for VMware for its partners and customers uh, right across Australia and New Zealand, and also includes uh, Oceania, so Papua New Guinea, Fiji, uh, and so on. Yeah, fantastic. If you need anyone to deliver something in Fiji, you let me know. I'll happily go out there and deliver it on the beach under a palm tree. We do so, have a trainer who loves going to Fiji, yeah. and he's also been in Port Moresby in the middle of earthquakes and blackouts and all sorts of things, so uh, he's a very resilient trainer. Uh, very good. Well, resiliency is important in our industry, so uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good to hear. Um, cool. So let's let's kick off. I think one of the things that over my career is I've heard a lot is why would I send someone on a course? Why would I get them to do a VCP or a VCAP? You know, what are the benefits you see in, in VMware education and, and certification? Well, I think my own experience is that, um, and I hope you might agree with this, is one of the benefits is it gives you a, a sense of confidence. And so, you know, people who are in technical roles get thrust into projects and you know if you've uh, completed the the vendor training that's available for that specific technology then i feel that that you can approach the task with a great deal more confidence so vmware i think has uh, a reputation for having a very robust training and certification program um, we have uh, high valuation scores for our delivery, which includes our courseware, uh, our instructors, our labs. And then I think we've got a pretty good reputation for a fairly solid uh, exam program where the exams are based on the courses, but they, they also choose from a, they select from a pool of questions, which might, uh, about 70% would be covered in the, in the course but we're looking for another 30% in terms of real world experience mm. that a candidate would have to get through the exam. So I think that, you know, from the individual's point of view, then uh, it's like the old uh, toothpaste ad, you know, you get the ring of confidence after you use the toothpaste. So I think that you get that as an IT professional, if you've been through um, the course and, you know, maybe your company or your organization's invested in the training for you. And then also if you've studied and passed the exams, I think you can feel confident that uh, you're well prepared for those tasks. I think from the organization's important point of view that's employing the IT professionals, it's it's a way of validating that they're that they're ready um, for projects. So validating um, skills. You know, I think if uh, if your team members have been on VMware training, they've completed the training, then I think you can presume that they've achieved a level of competence. If they uh, pass through the exam, you've validated um, what they've learned. And we've got some customers who even think about our programs from a compliance point of view. Uh, there's some organisations who are in uh, regulatory frameworks. They need to have compliance programs against risks that they've got in their organisation. So we get feedback sometimes that the robustness of our training and certification is strong enough for those organisations to think of it as a compliance program in terms of the regulatory risks that they that they face. Mm. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting one. It's, uh, you know, when I was starting end to end, um, you know, going through the insurances and getting all that required stuff, uh, a lot of the questions I was asked was, you know, are you qualified to do this work? And I was like, oh, I'm glad you asked actually, because, you know, we've gone through all these different levels of, of certification and education. Uh, and that was able actually to reduce the premiums because we demonstrated that, you know, we had that high level of expertise uh, for the services we were providing. So I hadn't thought of that actually as a benefit until you just mentioned it. But uh, 
yeah, it was a it was a good one for me, and certainly I'm sure it is for like you say regulatory customers. No, oh, that's right, and I think that uh, you know the qualification and professional certification um, are important parts of um, uh, operating as a IT professional. Most of well, many of the candidates that we have have come through um, either the university system or the TAFE system, so they've picked up qualifications through the Australian Qualifications and Training Framework, and then we can help them with the, the specialist knowledge and specialist certifications that they need um, on, our, on our technology. So I agree with you if you have a person who's achieved um, qualifications and they've got uh, vendor certifications, then um, probably you can tick the box in relation to insurance that an organisation's done the best they can to make sure they've got a team that's got validated skills. Mm. Yeah, actually, one thing I've done over the years is when I'm using a product that I'm not familiar with, like back in the day, it was SRM. Um, and I remember like 10 years or however long ago it was, um, there was a little simulator that VMware released showing how to do certain tasks with SRM. And I remember going through that and going, oh, actually, this is really handy because I was working on a design and I wanted to make sure I'd covered all the bases. And, and this tool uh, and one of the hands-on labs at the time, one of the early ones, um, was one of the tools I used to make sure that I had all the components uh, in my design uh, before it went off for a, a peer review. So I've actually found that quite interesting as well, is making sure if you run through those labs um, against what you're designing, you can actually make notes. Oh, I need to make sure I consider this piece. Or, hey, there's an option here. I've got option A and option B. I better research what these two options do so I can make an informed decision. So I think you're right. If you complete a course and you've done the exam, at least you've got that minimum level of skill to be able to, to start that project off with a, a better chance of success. Definitely. I think um, practicing in, in a platform is, uh, is a great way to research and, and prepare. Um, we still have hands-on labs, so there's extensive hands-on labs available at, at no cost. Um, for anybody who really wants to jump in and uh, spin up uh, VMware te technology in, in the cloud. Some of it might be simulations and some of it's a bit more um, sort of live platform. Mm. But it's also a feature of the digital learning offering that we have that's accessible under a subscription called Enterprise Learning Subscription. And what that's got is it's got uh, 70 or about 70 on-demand titles which are fully recorded versions of the course and all the labs and I guess the point is that that's one of the feedback pieces of feedback we get from customers who have the subscription is they valued being able to jump into a lab for a specific course and so it's available uh, within their subscription so let's say, let's say it's a one two three or five year subscription they can jump in at any time spin, spin up a lab and so if they've got a project they've got to do next week they can go in and spin it up and um, do some research and uh, run run through some of the um, course tasks to prepare. Mm. Yeah, and the ELS is actually something I only learned about recently. I think it was from you actually, but uh, you know, from my perspective, um, when I'm purchasing courses and trying to do courses, if I look at the cost of an ELS versus doing two courses, it's roughly the same. So I don't know if you can share numbers um, publicly, but. It, it's not an expensive thing to to subscribe to, considering you get, like you say, seventy titles. So, and these days, it's not just the vSphere piece, right? Everyone's using a lot more of that suite. So, if you're only sitting one course a year, that's probably not sufficient. So, if you're putting your staff through two or more per year, the ELS is actually far more cost effective. Uh, and, like you say, you can just access it any time. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's the that's the sweet spot in terms of the commercial proposition for ELS in, mo in most countries. So we've got um, differentiated pricing mm. all around the world. But in most countries, uh, e e a 12-month ELS subscription is approximately the same as about two courses. So for any person who needs to do two courses, then their organisation might consider that. Obviously, it's self-paced learning versus uh, classroom instructor-led training. So it depends on the learning style um, of the person, but it's got lots of flexibility in terms of being able to um, to jump in, jump out. And there's additional content in there as well, such as uh, exam preparation videos. So it depends on the learner, but uh, yeah, definitely ELS is, uh, is a great option for people who need to do two or more courses a year. And 
Josh, I think you'd probably agree today that, you know, it's a bit more complicated than where it all started with, say, uh, vSphere. You know, now we're talking about VMware Cloud Foundation or, or VCF. It's got multiple components. So you, you've got the vSphere piece, the NSX piece, uh, the vSAN piece. Perhaps it all needs to be managed with, uh, with ARIA. And so if you're the IT professional who's uh, involved with that platform, there's a lot of different technologies that need to be covered to be able to um, design and support that platform. Mm. And actually touching on the point you made earlier about the exams being pretty closely aligned to the, the courses, having done four or five exams myself this year, um, that's very true, actually. What, what I found, um, especially with the Tanzu exam, was I'm certainly, I still don't consider myself an expert in Tanzu. Lucky I've got uh, a great team of people who um, can make me look good in that space. But I found that the exam was very closely, in fact, aligned to the course. So when I went through the course and all the materials, I went, oh, okay, actually, yeah, this isn't too bad. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was lucky enough to pass that one. Um, yeah, having not a huge amount of experience with Tanzu, but, uh, yeah, the course was actually pretty closely aligned. So, yeah, that's a fair call. Yeah, congratulations on passing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I think they, uh, hopefully the content and the labs um, were useful against the exam, but also, uh, as I'm sure you've used quite a bit, the exam preparation guide is a pretty good tool as well in terms of um, directing the candidate to additional content to review, um, to prepare for the exam. And so hopefully that uh, is all a comprehensive preparation that gives the candidate the best chance of getting through. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that, that I really enjoy and, and appreciate certainly as a business owner as well is the on-demand capability. Um, you know, I'd be very... I would struggle for sure this year to have gone into a course for two full days or three full days or four or however long they are. Um, just doing them on demand I found was was much better. You know, I could knock out a couple of modules at, at night after dinner, you know, get up early in the morning, knock out a module, do some work and, and fit it around my schedule. So I think the on demand is really good and there's still obviously a place for in-person and, you know, especially anything to do with design workshops. I think it's very valuable to do in-person um, but yeah, certainly on demand has been a, a huge help for me. So it's it's good content. Yeah, I guess it is a big it's a big change that's occurred in an industry over over the years. I mean, if you look back over the last say um, ten to twenty years, um, you know, we're really a instructor led training type um, delivery organisation. Particularly back in the days when you needed to have a classroom workstation to have the labs mm. uh, on it, so they went to the cloud and also, you know, I guess learners um, and their organisations expect, expect expressed a preference for more flexibility um, in learning. And mm -hmm. it really depends on um, the person because some people are willing to, um, you know, learn after hours on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, others enjoy instructor-led training because you've got five days uh, you get in front of a person in terms of a, a trainer, uh, you might get lunch uh, and that type of thing. And so there are um, different experiences. But our job as the, you know, the vendor really is to make sure we've got all those different modalities offered um, mm -hmm. for the learner, um, the learner's preference and also at the right time. Because, Josh, you might agree that uh, as you go through the learning journey, there might be times, for example, at the beginning where instructor-led training is important to get over, mm -hmm. I guess, the, the big sort of acceleration in skills at the beginning. But once you become a more advanced uh, learner, then more continuous learning, access to um, online uh, self-paced assets uh, becomes a very important part of, uh, of the learning journey. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, back in the day when I did my install configure manage on, on vSphere 3, I think it was, or, or VI3 it was called back then, um, that was in person. And certainly, you know, I needed that in person at the time. Um, I think once people get to like VCP and maybe multiple VCPs, then the on-demand um, is probably more applicable. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Having both is, is really good. And sometimes sitting in a room with an instructor focusing for a set period of days 
um, you know, you can get the outcome rather than just trying to fit it in throughout the day. So, yeah, it's good to have both options for sure. Um, and that actually leads me on to the next thing I wanted to discuss, which is the exams. So we've, we've gone through, we've done our in-person or our on-demand training. Um, again, something I, you know, I've only experienced again this year, having reviewed, renewed a bunch of certifications. Uh, but can you tell us the different exam uh, proctoring options we have available now? Well, there was a big change for VMware. It was really a forced change through COVID because we were running uh, an instructor-led training business mainly. Mm. And we were also running a business where candidates needed to go to uh, an exam centre. And the big change with COVID is we had to flip the delivery model to virtual instructor-led training pretty much uh, overnight. Mm. Uh, our self-paced online learning became uh, more popular during COVID. And the other piece we need, needed to switch on was the remote proctoring of exams. So we managed to uh, spin that up fairly quickly. Uh, fortunately, the vendor that we use, Pearson, already had the capability, so they just needed to build it for um, our delivery. Mm. And so, so today, um, you can still go to an exam centre for an exam if, if you wish. But otherwise, uh, you can go through the portal and book a proctored exam at a time that, uh, that suits you. And you can really sit the exam from the location of your choice, which might be, might be home. And uh, as we've talked about, Josh, you've got to follow the rules. So, you know, there's all sorts of guidelines. You've got to clear your desk, take photos of everything around all of the walls and make sure that you're not going to get interrupted in terms of um, people or pets bursting through the door because the proctor might take a, uh, a dim view of that. But I've set a couple of those proctor's exams um, this year, and I think uh, you've had some experience with them as well. Mm. And uh, it's it's a great experience to, you know, not have to worry about uh, getting into the exam centre. Yeah, I mean, as we discussed uh, off air, you know, I, I remember, you know, quite vividly driving like an hour to a testing centre, you know, many years ago through terrible traffic on a rainy day, you know, couldn't find parking at the testing centre and then you get into the test centre and then there's a whole bunch of people all with their umbrellas, you know, waiting in a queue to wait for a slot on the three PCs that were sitting in this little fishbowl looking room. Um, and I remember I just was not in the mood for the exam by the time I actually got there and sat down. Um, whereas the remote proctoring, um, you know, I've scheduled some at like 6.30 in the morning um, so that I wake up, have a coffee, sit down and focus and get the exam done you know, before the start of my day. And for me, that worked really well. Um, obviously, yeah, you've got to, you know, I had to tell my daughter not to come uh, storming into my office. Uh, but uh, other than that, it, it was really good. I'm sitting at home, I'm comfortable and, you know, I've got a nice chair and all that sort of stuff. So I actually found it, you know, much easier uh, than going to a testing center. And um, so it's quite a good process, actually. For sure. Yeah, so I really enjoyed that. So, um so we've talked about uh, the fact we've got the on-demand training, the in-person. You also touched on the fact that you've got um, virtually delivered courses, so instructor-led but virtual. Um, I didn't even know you had that, actually, so that's news to me. But uh, can you quickly cover off what uh, what that looks like? Well, we, we still run a, a schedule of courses which are delivered by VMware and also delivered by VMware learning partners mm -hmm. in uh, Australia and New Zealand and also in Asia. So uh, you can find the schedules available uh, online on the VMware Learning website. There's uh, also there's a guaranteed to run page as well. So you can see classes that already have registrants that we're saying that uh, are most likely um, to run. And so the virtual format is typically you know, it's the two to five day format. We run in multiple time zones in uh, New Zealand. Um, typically, we're running three time zones or so in Australia, East Coast, Adelaide and mm. uh, and Perth. And some of those time zones, Perth, for example, links up to Singapore. So sometimes there'll be a combined class with, um, with uh, registrants from Asia and mm. also registrants from Australia. And the format uh, we're running... Um, you know, uses a collaborative platform such as uh, such as Zoom, 
virtually delivered um, lectures, um, online courseware, which is the same courseware that's uh, uh, delivered for classroom training or for the on-demand, and then labs available through um, the VMware lab platform. So um, virtual delivery has become very popular, and I think that, um, you know, COVID certainly drove it. We were doing probably 30% virtual, 70% classroom prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. It's probably flipped back the other way now mm -hmm. with a much smaller percent of classroom and a higher percent of virtual. And I think it's likely that it's probably going to stay that way because a lot of people value the flexibility of virtual delivery, don't have to travel into the training centre, which could be travelling into the city or travelling um, interstate. And also we've got a lot of flexibility with it. So we run hybrid. A lot of the classrooms that we use have uh, virtual capability. So we might have people in the class and then people attending uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. And so some of our classrooms are full telepresence classrooms, 260 inch screens, multiple cameras and all of that so that we try to give uh, the in-class registrants and the remote registrants uh, as um, similar experience as we possibly can. And, you know, the rooms are mic'd up so you can still have those peer-to-peer -peer conversations between classroom and virtual mm -hmm. uh, attendees. The other nice thing about it is that um, it's got flexibility. So we have some candidates who start Monday or Tuesday, something happens, and by Wednesday, they have to be somewhere else. So they move from being a classroom attendee to a virtual attendee. And so it's great to have that flexibility in the platform. So if circumstances require a person needs to move around, we can still work with them to complete the class. Yeah, fantastic. No, that's a really good option. It'd uh, be quite interesting to attend and, and or deliver one of those courses, I think. It's, uh, yeah, it can be done very well these days. I personally like using a light board. So I've got a little Lightboard studio so I can do remote whiteboard sessions. Um, and, uh, yeah, customers and partners seem to love those. So, yeah, it'd be an interesting experience to do uh, the telepresence one. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that uh, the move to virtual meant that our instructors needed to learn new skills in terms of delivery. Mm. So we've got trainers who've spent years and years on their feet in front of a classroom. So they've got all of the skills in terms of classroom delivery. But if you move that to a full virtual delivery, that's a different skill set. And so we needed to work with our trainers for them to learn how to make the virtual delivery as interactive as possible using the tools in the collaboration platform, but also changing the delivery methods um, to realize that we're in a virtual environment mm. and we need to engage and connect with the, with the learners. But I've seen... Uh, the some of the lightboard presentations that VMware's done, and I mean that's an amazing technology mm. for a very sort of impressive uh, uh, experience in terms of communicating a technology. So I'd love to see one of uh, of your presentations one day. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll happily do that for you. And uh, yeah, I think it's visually appealing as well. Like whiteboards, I've really enjoyed over the years, but I think lightboard with the dark background it means you're really focusing on what's on the the lightboard. Um, whereas on a whiteboard, especially if the lighting's not great, it can be glary and things like that. So, yeah, luckily I've got this really cool lightboard and, uh, yeah, the studio works really well. And, yeah, I'm going to be putting out some some content actually on this podcast, uh, which will include lightboard videos. But, uh, yeah, we will definitely uh, collaborate on some activities on that lightboard in the, in the near future. So, yeah, have you got any final thoughts to, to wrap up this topic? Because... Our next guest is obviously one of your colleagues, Louise, who's going to talk to us about the value of these certifications in the context of partner certifications with, with the master service competencies um, and the solution competencies as well. Um, so any final thoughts before we, uh, we break here and we jump to, to part two? Well, no, but I guess, um, you know, we've each at different levels come through um, IT professional type roles. And so, you know, uh, I mentioned that I'd done a couple of certifications uh, along the way, but nothing like um, what you and some of your 
colleagues have done because mm. um, when you look at the program we run, we've got multiple levels. So we've got um, VMware Certified Technical Associate or VCTA. We've got VMware Certified Professional or VCP. We've got uh, uh, VCAP, uh, VCIX and the VCDX. And you're a VCDX and so are some of your uh, colleagues. And I mean, that's uh, an, ex an extensive uh, investment in learning the VMware technology involving our advanced uh, courses, some of the toughest exams, but also even, I think, a, uh, a sort of design panel challenge in front of other experts that you've got to get through to get through to VCDX. So there aren't many VCDXs uh, in the world. And so, you know, uh, the investment that you and your colleagues have made in VMware training is, uh, is inspirational. And, uh, you know, I look forward to further collaborations with you. Mm, yeah, fantastic. I appreciate the compliments. It's, uh, yeah, it's been a really fun journey. So I've talked about my, my VCDX journey on an earlier episode. So please jump in and, and see that uh, for anyone listening who hasn't listened to it. Uh, but yeah, certainly it's, I can't recommend it enough. I think, you know, when you go through the process and even when you get to VCDX, a, a lot of my colleagues and friends who are VCDXs, we feel it's the beginning, not actually the end of the journey. So you go through all these steps, you get to VCDX, you've sort of climbed a mountain, but then you realize there's another mountain to climb after that. So, um, and as I mentioned, like I, I was VCDX like 12 years ago or something. Since then, I've probably done 10 more courses and 10 more exams, and I'm just continually trying to learn um, with not just VMware, but other vendors as well. So yeah, it's just continuous learning. We're in an industry that moves very quickly. So if you don't continuously learn, you're gonna get left behind. So. I think all the options we talked about today have, have certainly helped me and my team um, at end-to-end, -end, you know, keep our stuff up to date and, and learn new things. So, yeah, hopefully uh, everyone listening is now aware of all the options and, uh, yeah, can follow our lead. Well, thanks to anyone listening and thanks to you, Josh. Thank you very much for your time, Mel. Cheers. Thanks.